before I have you turn to Ephesians, just stay right where Jim was. I, <laughs> every time he reads, why it provokes my mind. And, and, and you know, we're not here this morning because of blind faith. Okay, None of us are here because we think we know about Jesus. We think we know what he's done for us. This section of scripture that Jim read for us, right there at the end, starting in verse 16, this is an historical claim to eyewitness testimony. What Peter says is, you can believe this because I saw it with my own eyes. It's important that you always remember the scripture. This is, this is a, a direct apologetic it's a defense for your faith and my faith through Peter. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths. J Jesus wasn't a myth. They were, on, they were there on the mountain when Jesus was called out by God. This is my son, my son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, Peter and uh, who else was there? John, they wanted to build an altar for Moses and Elijah that appeared to the Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. God says, no, you listen to him, my son. And, and this is what Peter's talking about. We heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were all with him on the holy mountain. And he says, these prophecies that you know about from our forefathers in Judaism, they're true, and they're all about Jesus. So anytime you, you doubt your faith a little, I'm thinking, boy, God's really given me no reason really to believe. Forget about what he's done in your life. Go, go and take Peter's word for it. The man who was there, who saw Christ, and who was divinely inspired to write it down and tell you about it. That, that's the power of Scripture. Okay? Now, I know each one of us has our own reasons to have faith, and God has spoken to each one of us in, in several different ways. Uh, answered prayer, by far, is... I think what most of us would say we have in common by the way God has spoke to us. He spoke to us through His Son. He spoke to us through the Holy Spirit, through the Scriptures. But over and over and over, I think it always for me, and my faith, comes back to answered prayer. And I remember a time not so long ago when I wasn't feeling well and I went to the doctor and Dr. Fairley said, I think we just need to do an ultrasound of your abdomen. And so I went up and, and what's the guy's name we like so well? The ultrasound guy. No, I don't, Mark. Yeah, I don't remember, but he knows what he's doing. And, and he did both of our girls at Centerville, and, he's, and he's, he's, he's just an excellent, excellent, I think, ultrasound guy. Um, but anyways. Yes, that's it. What? Kevin. Kevin, Kevin. So, so Kevin gets to messing around on my stomach, and all of a sudden he starts paying a gob of attention to this one spot. I mean, he's like there forever. And so initially my mind goes to bad stuff. And he says, I'll, I'll share these results with your doctor. And I didn't ask him any questions because I know they're not supposed to answer. But I have a follow-up appointment with uh, Donna Ann a couple days later, and, and she walks in with tears coming down her eyes. And she says, you've got a mass on your pancreas. That's a death sentence. You know, pancreatic cancer is no good. And uh, she says, we need to do a, a, a CAT scan. And so, I, I don't know, I was kind of shell-shocked, but I called Wendy and she was bawling. And, and, but a lot of people started praying immediately about that, you know. And so, I don't know if it was four or five days later, I had a CAT scan. And, and uh, well, it's not on your, on your pancreas, it's on your liver. So we need to do a tri-layer scan of your liver. Well, they did a trilayer scan and people are still praying and I'm still really not worried about it. It is what it is. And lo and behold, there's nothing there. Now, I don't think the lens could be dirty three times. You know? And, and Doug's just recently experienced the power of prayer. Ronnie and Linda have just recently experienced the power of prayer. Over and over and over. So many of us have experienced the power of prayer. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. It's so very important in spiritual warfare, as we've been talking about in the, in the whole armor of God. But, but the power of prayer is separate from the armament. So we'll, we'll kind of figure that out here. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll go uh, through verses 10 through 20 as we have. And, and this will be 
close to the end of our Ephesians study. We'll probably have one more, but I'm going to take a break for it so we can study the gospel accounts of Christ's birth over the next few weeks leading up to Christmas. So uh, just for your information, if you want to be looking at Matthew and Luke real closely in the first few chapters, that's what we're going to be talking about leading up to Christmas, okay? But we'll read this morning from Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul here in verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, to that end with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. He's not being subtle. He's being very direct, all times. All prayers and supplications, all perseverance, all the saints. Paul is pleading with the Ephesians to pray. He's pleading with us. It is a plea within the realm of spiritual warfare presented in this context. That's what we're talking about. We can't forget the context. Spiritual warfare. The plea is for the opportunity for the church corporately and individually to acquiesce to the power that is so much greater than them or us or even our enemy. We need to acquiesce to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the advocate. He's our helper, some translations say, that Jesus promised the disciples whenever he spoke encouraging words to them in John chapter 14. I'm going to read two little sections from that excerpt in chapter 14, starting first in verses 15 through 17. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him. We know him because he dwells with you and will be in you. Forever, John says, writes, Jesus says. Then later in chapter or in 14, verses 25 through 26, Jesus continues with, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you your remembrance, all that I've said to you. See, it's through not only the disciples, but through the Holy Spirit that we gain understanding of what Jesus has said. You know, I, I remember all the stories that, that I, I was taught when I was in Sunday school and children's church. I, I remember them well. But once I was immersed into Christ and received the Holy Spirit, those, those stories took on a whole different meaning. They were so much deeper. They, they, they made sense to me. They just weren't something that was amazing, you know, but, but they, were, they were about me. And I didn't get that until I received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third personality, if you will, of the three-in-one Godhead, or what we call the triune God. Now, you're not going to find that term, triune God, anywhere in your Bible. But it is a biblical term nonetheless. It is a doctrine that has been established from the very beginning. The Godhead, the three in one, the triune God. The Holy Spirit hovered above the waters. The Lagos was with God. 
in the beginning. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's a fact. I don't know how it works. I don't know how three essences or personalities exist together and apart, but they do. And God, the Holy Spirit, resides in us. The helper is God himself. And we should fully understand that the spirit of our mighty God, the creator of everything in the vast universe, is the awesome power that's available to us, that dwells within us. You need to get that this morning. You need to understand that there is a greater power in you than you ever thought possible in yourself. A greater power in you than your enemy ever thought possible. Why would we want to face the enemy alone on our own power when we have this power source within us that will make our spiritual battles a no contest? Are you familiar with the term no contest? How it applies in a boxing match? You remember a long time ago, Roberto Duran? Remember that name? No mas, no mas. No more. Turned out he had a bad bellyache, but he was saying, uh-uh, I don't want to fight anymore. I'm done. Okay, I'm done. That's the kind of power that Jesus has against the enemy. No contest. No contest. We wouldn't want to face the enemy alone on our own power when we have the other in us. Dr. J. Vernon McGee tells us in his commentary that, quote, praying in the Holy Spirit is not turning in a grocery list to God. You can't write down what you need and just say, here it is, God, okay? <laughs> it means when we pray in the Spirit that you and I recognize our enemy. And a lot of times the enemy appears so much powerful than us. We're overwhelmed. And that we lay hold of God for spiritual resources. Before we received the Holy Spirit, would you have considered yourself a spiritual person? We're just physical beings until we receive the Holy Spirit. So why would we, as physical beings, think that we could do any good in a spiritual battle without God's spiritual resource? We lay hold of God for that which is spiritual, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. And we've already talked about all the fullness of God. That's what's available to us. Not just a little bit. All of it. The complete God in us. So praying in the Spirit. I've been talking about armament. And we've already discussed the six pieces of armament in this section of Paul's epistle. Is this a seventh element? Is prayer a seventh element? Paul has presented us with piece after piece of armor in a very deliberate fashion. He's given us uh, very good descriptions. It seems logical that this is just another piece of the weaponry. It most certainly is a powerful weapon or tool at our disposal. Jesus himself has provided us direct access to the throne of God to petition him with all prayers and supplications. We read that in Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 19 through 22, this is the work that Jesus did that went behind the curtain. The veil has been torn asunder in two. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. He's talking about the old Jewish holy of holies, which was separated by a, a curtain. And only the high priest could go on in there. But now we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. His flesh being torn, being beaten, represents the destruction of that curtain. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See, that's what I struggle with, personally. I'm just not good enough to come before the throne of God. My heart is ugly. It is full of wickedness. I'm trying to be repentant. I'm trying to live a good life, but I still have this sinful nature about me. I don't deserve to go before the throne of God. Should I use that as an excuse? 
Not to. No, because it says, let us draw near with full assurance of faith because our hearts have been sprinkled clean. We need to get that there's nothing that we can do except put our faith in Christ and have full assurance that we can come before the throne of God because what He has done for us. It's not about me, it's about Him. And when we get it's about Him, then we can understand that yes, we have the right to come before the throne. And we need to come before the throne. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Our ability to access the Father through prayer is, however, not part of the armament of God made available to us. Now you may think, you're crazy. It's right there in there. It's not part of the armament. Look at how Paul uses prayer in the paragraph compared to the other pieces of armament. Each other component of godliness is compared to a piece of the Roman soldier's armor. Okay? Every other piece of armament of the Roman soldier is compared to godliness somehow. And prayer is not part of the analogies that Paul uses. It's just not. Prayer is compared to nothing. When Paul describes prayer here, there's nothing but exhortation and encouragement to use prayer as part of spiritual warfare. We must remember that we are wrestling against evil spiritual elements of our day. The same pieces of God's armor are available that were presented to the Ephesians, and that goes the same for accessing our mighty God through prayer. The same deal is available to us. We can put on that armament, and we can go to God in prayer. We need to go back to the key word. The key word is all in our lesson today. All. It's an all-encompassing word. So we'd understand that Paul is saying we must constantly be offering up a stream of prayers to God. Who does that? When you're driving to work in the morning, are you saying, God, help me turn the steering wheel left and put on the left blinker, and God, help me turn the steering wheel back right and push down on the... You don't do that. Okay, that's not what Paul is talking about. This encouragement is not that like an experience of mysticism either, like a Buddhist monk who, who prays over all of his words and all of his actions. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is instead helping us understand that we must maintain an open dialogue with God. It means we can go to Him anytime we want. And we should go to Him all the time. But it doesn't mean that we're in some sort of state of praying over every single thing. Okay, God wants to hear from us, but it's not a ritual per se. Okay, it's not a tradition per se, and we're going to talk about that. There are four separate exhortations that Paul gives us involving prayer in verse 18. First one is praying at all times. That means in all occasions, in all opportunities, in all circumstances. Particularly in this context, we need to pray in every circumstance of the evil day as we are engaged or preparing to be engaged for spiritual warfare. That is the attacks of Satan and the spiritual dark forces behind him. We need to keep our eyes open, it says, keeping alert. Because Satan is just waiting for opportunities to catch us off guard and exploit our weaknesses. And I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of weaknesses to exploit. They're all around us. There's all kinds of things that provoke our sinful nature, that tempt us, that try us. We have to take, each one of us has to take an honest assessment of our hearts and determine what our weaknesses are. Have you done that? I'm going to be honest with you, I have. I have looked within, and I have determined what is my most vulnerable situation, state of mind, emotional response, and there's a lot of them. And I've admitted them all to God in prayer. And I said, this is where I'm at, God. You already know this, but I'm admitting to it. Now, do something about it. 
Help me do something about it. That's what you've got to do. If you're not honest with yourself, how on earth are you going to be honest with God to get Him to help you in your weaknesses? If you're not, if you're not able to man up and say, this is where I fall short, why do you expect God to reveal it to you? He already knows. He wants you to understand it so you'll go to Him for help and not try to fix it on your own. So I don't know about you, whenever I try to fix it on my own, it doesn't work out very well. Okay? So we may need to tighten up the belt of truth and shore up the loose ends that we know exist in our heart. Okay? But make no mistake, we are to use the power of prayer at all times in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in our own power. This is spiritual warfare, so we must rely on the Spirit to help us. Spiritual warfare necessitates the Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf. We're only spiritual beings because the Spirit is in us. He is not only our advocate in heaven, but... He will lead us and direct us, revealing things to us that we cannot recognize on our own. He will help you understand your weaknesses. And He will help you find ways to deal with them. Because of the Holy Spirit, you will be able to discern God's Word and make application of it in your life. He will speak to the Father on our behalf, whenever we don't even know what help we need or how to ask for it. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, the Charismatics... We'll interpret this one way, but I do not want you to understand this praying in the Spirit as a view of speaking in tongues. Okay? This has nothing to do with speaking in foreign languages. That was a gift given to the apostles for their ability to communicate the gospel message to a ton of different dialects. This has nothing to do with speaking in foreign tongues, but it is very much about praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the second exhortation. Praying at all times in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is when, as Tim Bourgeois explains, that we are aware of the Spirit's presence as we pray. We are aware of His help, His power, and in His encouragement, etc., etc., etc. You you know those times when you're praying. I personally feel it when emotion just comes over me as I pray. When I'm really being honest with God and my heart is wide open and broken. And I'm humbled before the throne. I know that's the Holy Spirit involved in helping me pray. This isn't like saying grace or bedtime prayers. It can be. But this isn't like just a simple prayer of thanksgiving for the meal before us. This isn't just a, a prayer of we pray with our little children or our grandchildren at night when we put them to bed. Now, th- I'm not saying that those prayers aren't proper and have their place. They do. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Praying in the Spirit, those type of prayers are like crisis moment petitions. You know, when you're ready to pull your hair out, when you just can't take it anymore, It's like the attacks in the evil day by the spiritual forces of darkness. That's what Paul's talking about. It's in these times we pray in the Spirit, praying all prayers. Our third exhortation, praying all prayers with perseverance. Praying all prayers is what Paul is teaching us about in this exhortation. What kind of 
prayers can you think of? This morning I'm asking you, not, not rhetorically, what kind of prayers are there? There's a couple good ones, yes. The praise they would call adoration. Thanksgiving is Thanksgiving. When we pray a prayer of Thanksgiving, what are we usually doing? Thanking God for His provision, His blessings, His protection, His intervention. There's prayers for, to have courage. Absolutely. And, and a lot of times when we're praying for prayers to have courage, we're praying a prayer of confession. I, I don't have it within me to do this, God. Would you give me courage? I fall short in this area, God. Would you help me? Nick said pr praise, okay, prayer of adoration. When we sing hymns, we are singing songs a lot of times of adoration to God. Adoration is adoring. I mean, think about how you adore your child, you adore your wife. That, that's what prayers of adoration are toward God. We're, we're telling God we love you so much. We're, we're, we're so grateful of what you've done for us. We don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord. I mean, all those things are prayers of adoration. Another one is supplication. A prayer of supplication is where we make a specific request. And we're going to talk about that one quite a bit in a minute. When we make a specific request for God, uh, a lot of times for someone else. Okay? In a, intercessory prayer is a form of supplication, and that is when we are praying on behalf of someone else. And we've all done that. We've done that individually. We've prayed for each other through times of crisis. And we've done that corporately as a body. Together we've prayed on behalf of someone else. And there, there are many other types of prayers, okay? But our prayers should never become robotic or, or offered for show, where we're just going through the motions or, or we're praying to, to impress someone else that's hearing our prayers. Jesus accosted the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and their high opinion of tradition over the meaning and purpose of God's law. Theirs was a religion of outward worship to Jehovah without a changed or humbled heart. When we worship God, when we pray to Him, we better come to Him with reverence. Reverence I don't get too far off on a tangent, but I would say reverence doesn't mean what it used to mean. Okay? And, and I don't know whose fault it is, but I know if we want to get back to a state of reverence that's proper, we've got to start teaching our kids. And we've got to start displaying it in our own relationship with God. To revere God is to fear Him in a healthy way. To be consistent in our relationship with Him, speaking specifically about being repentant and worshiping Him, when, when we have reverence with God, what we're basically doing is saying, God, you're most important right now. All the time, right now. You're most important. To revere God is to make Him number one in your life. And it can't just be pick and choose moments. But specifically in prayer, we need to be reverent to God. There was no reverence, no real reverence or compassion with the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They had, they had went way off the beaten path in what God intended in a relationship. They exalted themselves in prayer. There's a great example, and I want you to notice at the end of Luke Chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. I want you to notice the contrast of Jesus' concluding statement. This is what he says. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Jesus said, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Some translations just say sinner. But in those days, the tax collector was the ultimate Jewish sinner. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, 
I thank you that I am not like the other men or sinners, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. God, I thank you that I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing far off wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he just beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We have to be reverent. Regardless of when or how we are praying to God, we, om- we always have to be sincere and forthright. Look, if you've got nothing to say to God, that's fine. Talk to him later. But don't go through the motions for show. You know, I'm terribly, terribly guilty about forgetting to say grace. And Claire's like, Dad, are we going to pray? And I've already got my mouth full. You know, yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. But she's sincere about it. And I haven't even thought about it. So I let her do the praying. Okay, she, she's the one that's got the ball at this point. Okay, for me to say, no, you're not going to pray, I'm going to pray. Well, it wasn't even important to me. I'd just be going through the motions. And God knows that. Why do I, I want to be a hypocrite in front of my own kids? Yeah, I, I should remember to give thanks for my meal. I should. And it's, a, it's an excellent example to other people in, in public. But that's not the point. The point is to give thanksgiving, not to show each other that you're a religious person. Okay? God knows our needs even before we ask. You get that? He already has an honest assessment of you before you've made it. He knows your ins and outs. He knows all the secrets that we know about ourselves that we won't share with anyone else. Let's not be pharisaical, as we just read, and just pray to go through the motions as if we were religiously all that. Because we're not all that. Every one of us, every one of us is guilty and deserves hell. Jesus' half-brother, Jude, when I say half-brother, he was brother to Jesus through Mary. Jesus' brother Jude wrote about the love that God has for each one of us and how each one of us should respond in personal, purposeful prayer to God. In Jude 1, verse 20, I guess just verse 20 since Jude only has one chapter, he says, but you, beloved, remember what beloved means? We're special, set apart child of God. God loves us as, as we're his only child. But you, only child of God, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying through the Spirit, in the Spirit, builds up that most holy faith. Not only for us individually, but corporately as a church. The fourth and last element of prayer that Paul writes about to the to the church is about a type of prayer. And I mentioned this earlier. Paul places a special emphasis on praying prayers, a supplication for all the saints. Okay? I try to do it purposefully and not for show, but any time that, that I close a prayer in a sermon, to pray for you all as a body. You all are saints. You're no longer sinners. I want God to bless you as saints as you leave this place, that He protect you, that He, that he prosper you. And I'm, I'm sincere about that. You all, have, you all have humbled yourself before the cross of Christ. Supplication, by definition, also known as petitioning, is a form of prayer wherein one party humbly or earnestly asks another party to provide something. In our case, we're asking God. To provide something, either for ourselves, who is doing the supplicating, or on behalf of someone else, as if I were to go to God in prayer for Connie, or for Mark, for Terry, or Linda, Cindy. We all, in this case, 
Supplication is where we specifically ask God to intercede on behalf of ourselves, or in this case, the saints. We need to constantly, I mean, this is so important that he, he spells it out in context with one of the other four. We need to constantly be praying for each other. We are the saints. There are other saints in this world we need to be praying for. There are missionaries putting their lives on the line every day. Do we remember them in our prayers? I hope so. I hope we remember them with our pocketbooks too because that's how they get by. We have to make focused requests when we pray. It's not that God doesn't know our hearts and minds and just doesn't act out graciously in His benevolent nature for us. He does that. He does things for us without our even asking all the time. I mean, if, if I got just what I asked for, my blessings would be so very limited because not because I'm humble, but because I'm lazy, I don't ask for much. I don't pray as much as I should. But we need to pray specifically. Generalities won't cut it. You know, yeah, we need to say, God, forgive us for our sins, but what are our sins? Do you know what your sins are? Have you looked within and said, God, I need help in this very specific area? He knows you're a sinner. You know you're a sinner. But do you know that you suffer with issues of gambling? Do you know that you suffer with issues of drinking? I mean, there's any number of things that you need to be honest with God about specifically. Because when you're honest with yourself and you're specific about it, your mind's on it, your heart's on it, and God's with you. The Holy Spirit's right with you. Paul is laying out for us here a heartfelt attitude of praying for specifics that we need to follow simply because that's what the Holy Spirit is teaching us right here in the Bible. We need to pray for specifics because the Bible says so. It's that simple. That's how we're to pray. It takes time. It takes will. It takes practice. Believe me, I know. And my prayer life is nowhere where I want it to be or where I know it needs to be. And don't make the mistake of rational, rationalizing away the need to pray for specifics with a poor attitude toward prayer. And that attitude can be justified with anything. Oh, I'm too busy. I, I, I'm, I'm too guilty. Any number of things can can in your mind and in your heart tell you, I, I, I'm not going to bother God with this. I'll do it another time. Because I just don't know that I'm ready to, to deal with it right now. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid that you're being selfish or troubling God with your problems. He's already troubled with them. He already knows them. He just wants to help you. We aren't to take prayer lightly, but we have to ask. We have to ask. We have to say it out loud, whether it's verbally or in our minds. We have to ask. In the fourth chapter of James, we have an excellent exhortation about prayer, especially as it applies to supplications. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, listen to this. Just listen. What causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You're, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. You spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If, if you pray to God, God, make me rich, make me wealthy, do you think that's in your best interest? Can you handle that? Can you use wealth to benefit the kingdom of God? Is that your talent? Or can you put it in the bank and draw interest? 
for yourself. God will bless you if it is for the kingdom of God and if it's in your will and if it's in His best interest for the kingdom and for you specifically. Look, we may be fully armored for spiritual battle. We may have all the pieces on, but there are some things that we can't do ourselves and we have to pray to God and say, fix this, Lord. Help me, Lord. Give me courage, Lord. Only God can accomplish some things. And it's through all kinds of focus and sincere prayers that we communicate our hopes. We communicate our anguish. We communicate our joys and our gratitude and our love for the Almighty God. He hears our prayers and He always responds to them, but sometimes the answer is no. And I hate that just like you hate it. Why not? And he says, no. It's not in your best interest and it's not in my plan. Now, if God can make it work, He's going to bless you. If you've prayed a prayer that's not based on your passions, He's going to bless you. But when He says no, it's during those times we have to be patient and we have to be obedient to God who knows a whole lot better than we do. I want to encourage you this morning... To recognize what it is you should pray for. Don't, don't just go blindly before the Lord's throne and not have any idea what you want to talk about. Okay? God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from you. Not just some flippant thought. He wants you to think it out and come before Him honestly because He already knows. And ask. Ask. Just ask. Thank Him for what He's done. I mean, we have so much to be thankful for. I mean, for, first and foremost, the blood of Christ, the atonement of our sins, is, is number one. But besides that, think of all the blessings in your life. Uh, this Tuesday, I'll just pitch it now instead of at the announcement time, but this Tuesday, I've texted some of you already, <laughs> But there will be a Thanksgiving service uh, that's provided by the ministerial alignment. It'll be at the Hartford Church of Hartford Church of Christ, the Hartford Baptist Church. Jeff Harlan, a classmate of mine, another one of those later in life hit your head against the wall preachers, will be preaching. Uh, I'm going to share some scripture. Just read scripture. If you've not been to a Thanksgiving service before, they're really lovely. They really are nice, and uh, it's an opportunity to give out of uh, the blessings that God has given to you to help support the Ministerial Alliance who is in charge of the food pantry, uh, the bargain barn, and those are two very special places that, that help people that we don't even know about on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you don't have anything going on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock and you can make the drive out to Hartford or you need a ride, call me. We've got some vehicles and we'll get you there and get you home. But you, you'll enjoy it, so I encourage you to do that. Let's pray. God in heaven, I'm just so thankful for this morning and the opportunity to speak on your behalf. God, I just uh, know there's so many other things that you had to say this morning that, that I know I didn't get said, and I pray for forgiveness for that. I thank you that the Holy Spirit has, has influenced what we've shared this morning, both originally as it was written and now as we have studied it together and thought about it together. I pray, Father, that you would help us now to digest all that we've talked about, to have the Holy Spirit move us in directions that we didn't know were possible, to build up our faith, to help us uh, in those hurdles of life like fear, fear of rejection, fear of persecution, to get past all of that and to really uh, be strong witnesses for you in this community and the state and this nation and this world. I pray, Father, for these saints that are here this morning that you would protect them and prosper them as you see fit. I know, Father, that there are so many faithful here this morning that are probably like me at odds with themselves at times, not thinking that 
They can be a useful vessel in certain situations. But Father, I just pray that you would reveal to us the weaknesses that we have so that we might come to you for help. But Father, we might realize that we, we can't hide anything from you, that you already know what it is we're struggling with. You already know our, our, our deepest, darkest secrets. It doesn't mean that we have to let the whole world know about them, God, but we need to be honest with you so that you might change our hearts and change our minds. God, thank you so much for providing us a, a dry place to meet this morning where it's warm. Uh, we don't have any leaks. We just have so much thankful, or so much to be thankful for, God, that we take for granted as we meet every Sunday. Father, I pray that through our testimony, through our sharing of the gospel, that you would bless us with growth spiritually. Father, that you would give us the courage to invite people to come to church and worship with us. And God, I, I know we're all here being edified this morning, but there are so many people that just need to hear that Jesus loves them. A very simple message, but a message that will make the difference in, in someone's life forever. So I pray, Father, that you would place that burden on our hearts. We don't want to drag people in kicking and screaming, but God, we need to help people see the joy that we have because of the love that you have for us. The fact that we understand grace, that we understand mercy, ought to be evident in our lives. And Father, that should be the attractive feature of drawing people to our congregation. So Father, bless us in that way, please. Father, go with us as uh, we continue this morning to worship you. Help us to set our hearts and minds right before the Lord's table. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.